Hi everyone, thank you very much for listening to my presentation. My name is Kathleen and I'm a postdoc research fellow with the donor research team at the Australian Red Cross Lifeblood. Here I've been working on a program of research around the use of non-cash incentives to encourage blood donation. Uh, in this presentation, I'm going to quickly summarize the studies and research methods we've undertaken so far, and then share with you some of the key insights and conclusions that we've drawn across the program. Now, maintaining an adequate panel of whole blood and plasma donors is an ongoing issue for many blood collection agencies, or BCAs as I'll refer to them, uh, with blood donation rem remaining below 4% in many countries. As such, there is an increasing interest globally around the use of recognizing, rewarding, and incentivizing donors to enhance the effectiveness and recruit, enhance the effectiveness, sorry, recruitment, retention, and reactivation campaigns, as well as to encourage higher frequency donation. So while the practice of recognizing donor contributions is widespread, the strategies used vary greatly. Further, the World Health Organization and European Blood Alliance are both advocating for voluntary, non-remunerated blood donation systems, thus excluding the use of cash, and, uh, cash payments. It's therefore important to investigate alternate ways to recognise, reward and incentivise donors for their generosity in ways that are more in line with altruist-focused forms of encouragement. Non-cash incentives like branded gifts, tickets, mo uh, vouchers, movie tickets appear to be promising strategy but the evidence regarding their efficacy is limited, but growing. Our research has and is currently being conducted within the Australian voluntary non-remunerated blood donation context, where lifeblood is responsible for all blood collections, including whole blood, plasma and platelets. Consistent with other VNR countries, Lifeblood's national donor recognition policy includes milestone badges and donation certificates, as well as intermittent token gifts of appreciation. However, blood donors and potential donors aren't incentivized to donate or make a blood donation appointment. So, so far, our program of research has consisted of four studies, a systematic literature review, a survey of donors and non-donors, interviews with some of these donors and non-donors, and an in-field reward trial. The icons used here show uh, will be used in the presentation to show which studies support the insights that are discussed. Um, but briefly, let's cover off what these four studies entailed. So first, we had the systematic literature review, where we identified a total of 71 papers for inclusion in the review to define and operationalize incentives. Of these 71 papers, nine empirically investigated attitudes towards incentives, 31 investigated the impact on blood donation behavior, and eight investigated the impact on blood safety, but these were mostly focused on cash payments. From this pool of evidence, we concluded that the effectiveness or the evidence for the effectiveness of non-cash incentives is still mixed, um, with some studies finding a positive effect while others finding limited or no effect. So it's still um, uncertain as to the benefits or the use of incentives. Next, we surveyed a random selection of donors and non-donors conducted online and via telephone by an external research company to reduce any potential bias. Uh, the sample characteristics were broadly representative of their respective populations, uh, while Perceived effectiveness of incentives is a common measure used in the literature. Studies were yet to consider the potential impact of introducing an incentive scheme on the reputation of the BCA. So even if donors and non-donors believe that non-cash incentives are effective in encouraging people to donate, any short-term increase in donations gained would be pointless if there's reputational damage that led to fewer donations in the longer term. So across 13 different types of incentives uh, that we identified via this systematic literature review, as well as through internal conversations, donors were asked the degree to which they believed each of these 13 items would encourage or discourage someone to donate whole blood or plasma in separate questions, 
while non-donors were randomised to be asked about either whole blood or plasma, but not both. We also asked participants the extent to which they would perceive lifeblood more negatively or more positively if each of these items were offered. This tapped into their potential impact on organisational reputation if lifeblood was to start using them. The order in which all of the 13 items were presented uh, was randomised and together we used uh, these three items per each incentive type to measure overall acceptability of that incentive. Uh, in this survey, we also sought to examine whether acceptability of incentives varied by their likelihood to donate, which we used um, actual subsequent donation behaviour for donors and an intention to donate measure for non-donors. The survey also included measures of cost benefit evaluation, psychological involvement, embarrassment, deal proneness, and a short measure of the mechanisms of altruism scale to help us further understand this varying acceptability of incentives that we see across multiple uh, studies. We then conducted some follow-up interviews with nine donors and nine non-donors who completed the survey. And these particular people expressed very, either very positive uh, attitudes towards incentives or very negative attitudes. So they were at either end of the scale. The interviews were designed to provide greater context to the survey findings, as well as explore some additional related issues. Each interviewee was asked, about, um, asked questions about the makeup and delivery of three different types of incentives. And these uh, varied across participants. Uh, they were also asked about whether they thought the introduction of incentives might affect their own and others' donation behaviour, whether uh, they thought the introduction of incentives would affect their level of advocacy, so the extent to which they might talk up or um, you know, provide word of mouth about lifeblood, and the coexistence of altruistic motivation and incentives, uh, which I'll talk a little bit more about uh, in a bit. Finally, or most recently, we've conducted a, a non-randomised controlled trial to test the effectiveness of a discount voucher reward among new and repeat plasma donors. Uh, the intervention group received standard incentive acknowledgement, so, you know, thank yous from staff, and were offered a voucher. Donors just attending to donate and receiving the standard acknowledgement formed the control group. This discount voucher allowed donors to receive um, a discount of about 30% off the price of any drink or sandwich purchased at a local cafe to one particular donor center and was not transferable or redeemable for cash. Uh, within this trial, the donation behavior of participants was monitored over three months so that we could determine whether this uh, particular reward encouraged uh, repeat donation behavior. All right, so now you know what we did, let's take a look at the key insights we've taken across this program of work, or as I like to think about it, the puzzle pieces that we've contributed to better understanding the use of non-cash incentives for blood donation, in addition to the work that other research teams around the world are all contributing. So the first piece uh, I wanted to discuss, which is important to provide in context, is that our work has helped to further define and clarify terminology used when discussing incentives, as well as categorizing incentive types. So recognizing blood donor contributions from a simple thank you, email to award functions is an important strategy for BCAs to show donors that they are valued. However, in the transfusion literature, the terms incentive and reward are often used interchangeably to describe items provided in recognition of a blood donation. However, there's an important distinction between the two where an incentive is offered before donating as a way to motivate action, whereas a reward is offered after donating to reinforce warm glow or you know, enhance that acknowledgement after the fact. But it is important to note that the same item, for example, a movie ticket can be used as both a reward an incentive strategy, just depending on when the particular item is offered. Uh, the categorization of items considered to recognize reward and incentivize donors is inconsistent 
broad or lacks clear empirical support. In our systematic review, we identified 12 types using content analysis. However, this again is quite, um, quite broad or perhaps too narrow to provide some meaningful framework around to understand which incentives work for who and when. So there was a need for a theoretically informed but empirically supported framework to guide the use of these, uh, what I call RRI strategies or recognition, reward and incentive strategies. So using the survey data and factor analysis, we found that six factors achieved a multi-dimensional solution with minimal cross loadings between the items that was most consistent with our theoretical underpinnings and each factor demonstrated strong internal reliability. The six categories represented travel reimbursement, health checks, charity donation, milestone gifts, reward programs or loyalty programs, and discount vouchers, which could be tickets, um, vouchers, discounts, or even price draw tickets fell within this particular um, group as well. Um, and they're characterized by several distinctions based on the characteristics of the item. So whether the item is congruent or incongruent to the act of donating blood, whether the item or the benefit is provided in public or in private, uh, whether the uh, benefit itself is also for the individual or to benefit others, such as a charity donation, and the reinforcement schedule. So whether the benefit or the item is provided in an immediate fashion or whether it's kind of a delayed or an accrued benefit, like in, as in a loyalty program. We also theorized a few other distinctions um, around whether the items were provided at set or variable intervals and between the guarantee or chance of obtaining an item. So for example, guaranteeing a movie ticket or the chance to win a larger prize but donors didn't seem to make these more nuanced distinctions. Next, so consistent with most prior research examining attitudes towards incentives for blood donation, uh, our donors and non-donors hold either neutral or positive views towards the non-cash incentives for whole blood and plasma. Uh, there were some significant but small differences between donors and non-donors for example, donors believed milestone awards and gifts, health checks and loyalty programs to be slightly more effective than did donors. Uh, those most likely to donate in the future, so those with the highest intentions or who returned to donate following the survey, uh, hold similar views towards non-cash incentives compared to those less likely to donate. So this is encouraging for BCAs considering introducing incentives as the findings suggest that the majority of donors and potentially and potential donors won't react negatively. There was only 1.9% of those surveyed who reported very low acceptability across all incentive types um, with a mean response of about two or less. And this is anticipated as we know Incentives is not a one size fits all kind of approach, and there will always be those groups who are against or you know don't want to be incentivized. And the impact of this small group then, while small, is still worth considering for BCAs who are contemplating introducing an incentives program. However, over 70% of our donors and 65% of non-donors would actually view lifeblood more positively or remain neutral if these non-cash incentives were introduced to encourage more people to donate. This is an important addition to the evidence base on non-cash incentives and reflects people's desire to help lifeblood achieve their aims, but also might indicate less societal stigma associated with incentives for altruistic giving. Given the variability in attitudes, we did want to understand a little bit more around what influences the, this acceptability? Um, so blood collection agencies need to be extremely careful to avoid a negative public response to introducing this type of incentive scheme. So whilst it's important to consider the effectiveness of a program, it's also important to understand what influences whether someone is supportive or opposed 
two incentives designed to encourage people to donate. So that incentives can successfully work toward donation objectives without undermining organizational reputation and subsequent donation behavior. As again, there's no point having a program that reduces organizational goals and donation targets. So in our research, we found cost benefit evaluation was the strongest predictor of one's acceptability of non-cash incentives, with this relationship particularly stronger for current blood donors than non-donors. Cost benefit evaluation included three items to measure the perceived cost and benefits to the blood collection organization that reflect a concern for the financial cost uh, associated with introducing non-cash incentives and the potential to promote blood donation and raise awareness of lifeblood. So the more um, positive this cost benefit evaluation was, the more perceived benefits and the lower perceived cost, the more accepting donors and non-donors were of non-cash incentives. Um, and that was stronger for donors. So while such relationships were weak, uh, we also found that those who find blood donation interesting and important, uh, this was our psychological involvement, uh, don't, those who are less embarrassed to receive an incentive and generally favour promotional deals are also more likely to accept incentives to encourage blood donation. While well, age was also found to have a weak um, negative impact on acceptability, consistent with prior research, cost benefit evaluation was a more critical than age when explaining um, this variability in incentives, which was quite interesting. Further, non-donors viewed the financial costs of incentives to be more acceptable and the benefits to lifeblood to be significantly greater when compared with donors. Non-donors also reported being significantly less embarrassed to receive an incentive and more prone to responding to promotional deals than donors. This reflects a segment who potentially without incentives may not be motivated to donate. They require that just little extra bit of motivation. Therefore, introducing non-cash incentives may work towards motivating entirely new deal prone segments to donate. Together, these um, findings suggest that when introducing an incentive program, communication should emphasize the benefits that may accrue to the organization, such as achieving donation targets or raising awareness, uh, consider partnerships that minimize any program costs, and also allow donors to respond to incentive promotions in a private setting to reduce any potential embarrassment. All right. So one of the main reasons why blood collection agencies are hesitant about introducing incentives is that they could potentially crowd out those altruistically motivated to give. Theoretically, however, giving is underpinned by a range of motives, um, differentially focused on the self, perceptions of others, and the likely recipient. So to explore the relationship between altruism and incentives, we administered a shortened version of the mechanisms of altruism scale and found that 87.8% of donors endorsed impure altruistic motivations, followed by 42% for kinship, 27% uh, for reluctant altruism, and only 3% for self-regarding. This shows that the majority of donors donate to benefit others as well as to gain emotional warm glow, which is impure altruism. Further, those endorsing impure altruistic motives were significantly positively correlated with almost all types of incentives and most strongly associated with supporting health checks and reward programs. We found that when donors uh, in the interviews discussed their positive view of incentives, they talked of incentives not as inducements to the name, but as tokens of appreciation or acknowledgement of a selfless act, or in the case of a point system as a personal achievement. So using this lens, incentives did not seem to conflict with their donor identity or altruistic motivations at all. This suggests that non-cash incentives won't crowd out altruistically motivated donors. Um, so although certain incentives uh, like discounts uh, or tickets have a stronger evidence base for use, 
There isn't one type of incentive that's been found to have universal appeal to donors and non-donors that positively impacts donation behavior. Again, there cannot be a one size fits all approach to using incentives. However, research into incentives for donation has predominantly prescribed an incentive within you know, the various trials that we identify, rather than allowing donors to choose their preferred form. In the broader literature, program related characteristics, including the perceived value and benefits of the items available, are the most common predictors of customer loyalty program effectiveness. So from the data across our surveys, interviews, and our trial illustrated the importance of giving donors choice of an incentive or reward. In the survey, blood donor and non-donor views of the different types were mostly positive or neutral. However, no incentive was viewed favorably by all. When interviewed about what they envisioned an incentive program for blood donation to look like, the majority of participants supported having choice due to the diverse characteristics circumstances and needs of donors. Some interviewees also remarked that giving people a choice of reward would allow the donor to feel in control and motivated to receive something they actually want rather than given something they might not like or see as a waste of resources. In the trial, which you can see in this um, graph, a lot of donors accepted the reward, about 70% accepted it, but not a lot redeemed it. The, about 20% of that 70% actually redeemed their discount voucher at the local cafe. The trial also did not increase the proportion of donors returning to the name. This suggests that the vouchers had little motivational power for most. Further, the majority of donors who declined the reward reported that they would just simply not use the discount voucher. So about 70%, and this could be due to the cafe's location, operating hours, product offering, or they would have preferred an alternative such as discounted movie tickets or a major store voucher. So none of the reasons for decline were negative in essence. It was simply just, it wasn't an incentive that, or reward, sorry, that the donor wanted. So together these findings illustrate that allowing donors to choose their preferred reward could enhance the effectiveness of reward and incentive programs and may help to explain some of the variability that we see in trials between those who find a positive effect, um, low effect or no effect. However, offering choice also introduces a need for blood collection agencies to secure partnerships that are brand consistent and will protect their reputation. So a little bit more work needs to go in when we offer choice. Finally, when controlling for age, sex, um, plasma donation history and donation success, um, being offered the reward, so that discount voucher, didn't significantly increase the likelihood that plasma donors would return to donate compared to the control. So the number returning didn't um, vary. However, those who were offered the discount voucher did return to donate plasma more quickly and donated plasma more often during that three month period following, um, following the trial compared to those who weren't offered the reward. So while being offered a discount voucher didn't appear to influence the decision to donate plasma again, that extra token of appreciation did seem to encourage them to donate plasma again sooner and donate uh, more frequently. Unlike incentives that motivate action by creating an expectation of reward, positioning the discount reward as a thank you seemed to appeal to those plasma donors who ordinarily would respond positively to being acknowledged and maybe predisposed to return. Other factors are more likely to be influential in whether a donor returns or not, but this did seem to have a, you know, a positive effect on their return behavior. Encouragingly, this effect was not dependent on accepting the reward, providing further evidence of this bolstered kind of thank you, warm glow effect. The results indicate that overall, offering a discount voucher doesn't deter donors from donating again, 
even if some donors choose to not accept or even redeem it. A voucher appears to encourage higher engagement in those who return, uh, just as it is. So in summary, the key points from across this work is that BCAs can be confident that neither donors nor potential donors will react negatively in a voluntary non-remunerated donation context. Non-cash incentives appear not to create out altruistic uh, blood donors. Incentives should be positioned as a thank you to help bolster or improve that warm glow feeling following a donation. Give attention to how the incentive program is implemented to improve uptake, such as emphasizing the benefits to the organization. And finally, there is no single type of non-cash incentive that appeals to all donors and non-donors and that we should consider allowing donors to choose their reward. Although it might complicate trial design, it may be beneficial in demonstrating an effect. So what next? Well, further research is needed to determine the relative efficacy of each of these um, recognition, reward and incentive categories of items uh, that we can use to motivate donor recruitment and retention as well as whether the strategy is more effective as an incentive to motivate action or reward to bolster that um, acknowledgement afterwards. Is a movie ticket better as an incentive or as a reward and so on. Most research also only considers offering each of these types of incentives or items as a one-off. There's been very few studies that have looked at patterns of behavior or multiple offerings of the incentive other than with cash payments. So further work is needed to understand how each of these item types could work as part of a broader loyalty program that maintains motivational power over the long term. Uh, it's also important to note that non-cash incentives are not a silver bullet solution and won't appeal to all donors or potential donors. So future research should explore whether incentives elicit that long-term commitment and by whom, who are they most effective for, or which items are most effective for which groups. At Lifeblood, we're preparing a series of trials to help answer some of these questions. So watch this space. If you're interested in learning more about the research methods and findings that I've discussed during this presentation, Please have a look at our publications. We have three additional papers currently under review or being drafted. So again, please reach out if you would like, like more information on the papers or if you'd like to receive updates when the uh, other papers are published. So thank you. I hope you've enjoyed the presentation. Please feel free to get in touch if you have any questions. And yeah, thank you so much.